Anai Busu in Anishinaabe, Falcha in Irish, and hey in Finnish. Welcome in English to everyone. I am using these ways of greeting by permission to signal that this is an intercultural project, a space for minds to meet, new kinship networks to be formed, and by agreement, stories and approaches to be shared. If questions, thoughts, or queries arise as you listen to this presentation, which will last about 35 minutes, please enter them in the chat facility and we will respond to them during a question and answer session at the end. There will also be a chance for you to speak your own questions directly live to the panel. My name is Joy Porter and I am the principal investigator on the project and it's called Brightening the Covenant Chain, Revealing Cultures of Diplomacy Between the Crown and the Iroquois Confederacy. We call it BTCC for short. Its objective is to carry out original research on something that so far has been a hidden dimension of the UK's cultural heritage, the British Crown's diplomatic relationships with the indigenous peoples of Northeastern America. We are extremely grateful to the Arts and Humanities Research Council for awarding £931,000 in standard research grant funds for us to carry out this work over 42 months. And we very much hope that everyone listening out there becomes part of the global network of interest that is already growing surrounding this project. The covenant chain that we hope to brighten, by the way, is a symbol of the long-term diplomatic and political alliances and relationships between the British Crown and the indigenous Northeast. So what is brightening the covenant chain, BTCC? It's a large program with seven individual work streams and there's a lot going on on multiple levels, but we've taken care to build the project around a series of access points for everybody, ranging from conventional academic conferences, uh, six academic books, podcasts, children's workshops, and schools outreach, very significant artist residencies and exhibitions at the American Museum and Gardens in Bath and at the North American Indian Museum in Zurich, as well as two exciting and very innovative digital outputs that we hope will have a legacy that long outlasts the project. One is a kinetic map that will animate historic maps held in the British Library collections. And the second is a digital soundscape, and we're very into soundscape at BTCC, that will recreate diplomatic speeches in the Mohawk language. You'll hear more about these later from colleagues involved, and you'll also hear about the Zooniverse people-powered research platform that we hope will uh, allow people from all over the world to actively research alongside us on this topic as it grows and develops. Brings me to introductions. BTCC's core research group, group are with us today and they're a truly exceptionally talented and globally significant group at the absolute forefront of their respective areas of endeavor. We're really lucky and grateful. I'll briefly run through who they are, and then if they would be kind enough to do so, I'll ask them to introduce themselves and their respective planned contributions to the project individually. I will begin with our Indigenous co-investigators and collaborators as a signal of our collective respect and gratitude for their involvement. Firstly, Professor Dale Turner, who is a citizen of the Tamagami First Nation and an internationally respected authority on contemporary Indigenous rights and intellectual culture and philosophy in Canada. Secondly, Celeste Pedri Speed, who is an Anishinaabekwa socio cultural anthropologist and a superb practicing artist with a particular interest in decolonial practice. She is Queen's University Canada's National Scholar 
in Indigenous Studies and also an Associate Professor there. We're also thrilled to be welcoming her husband, uh, who's going to be working within the project's outreach activities, Robert Spade. He's a gifted storyteller, traditional dancer, drummer, singer, visual artist from the Sturgeon clan. He's also an Anishinaabe and he's of the Fort Hope First Nation. Next, it's an absolute honor to welcome one of Canada's most distinguished scholars in public and constitutional law, legal history, and legal theory, Professor Mark Walters, Dean of Law at Queen's University Canada. I think it's a sign of how immensely capable Mark is as a leader of men that he's agreed to find the time somehow to be part of this project. But it's also a sign of the potential importance of the project's work to treaty negotiation and the growth generally of treaty rights and title in Canada. A further co-investigator is Pekka Hamelainen, Rhodes Professor of American History at the University of Oxford, an exceptionally talented writer and a figure at the absolute forefront of American historical scholarship in the UK and worldwide, whose work justifiably has been garlanded with international prizes. Finally, the inestimably capable Dr. Charles Pryor, is another co-investigator, senior lecturer at the University of Hull and author most recently of Settlers in Indian Country, Sovereignty and Indigenous Power in Early America with Cambridge University Press 2020. So at that point, I am going to ask the co-investigators to speak in the order that we've already worked out. So we'll begin with Professor Dale Turner, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy. Thank you. Uh, it's great to, to be here. I am in the UK and uh, at least for a few more months. And uh, my uh, uh, background is my father is uh, Temi Agama Anishinaabe from the Tamagami First Nation. So he's Anishinaabe and my mother is from Devon uh, in, here in England. And I work, uh, as uh, Joy said, mostly on contemporary Indigenous politics in Canada. I'm also interested in Indigenous intellectual culture. Mm -hmm. For this project, um, I am, I've uh, been exploring and have been interested in a while in Indigenous conceptions of political power, in particular unpacking Indigenous people's relationships to land and the language that they use to articulate these, these relationships, either in a court of law or in political relationship. In particular, with this project, I'd like to look at a little more closely the great law of peace um, as, a, as a, an exemplar of Indigenous political thought um, and, and as it was used to guide the early treaty making relationship and remains important even in uh, today in Canada, in, for example, the 1492 Lambac Lane is, is uh, the clan mothers uh, are, are uh, root their sort of political arguments in the great law of peace. Um, related to that is uh, I'm interested in, well, what I would call clan mother politics. Um, but the role of the clan mothers in not only unpacking uh, the uh, Iroquoian uh, notions of political power built into the great law, um, but also to explore the role that the clan mothers played in contemporary, uh, sorry, in uh, historical and contemporary uh, treaty making and politics. Um, uh, as I said, especially, uh, it's still relevant for today. Those of you familiar with the Oka. Oka conflict in, in 1492 are rooted in these long historical sorts of uh, relationships to the great law of peace and treaty making and, and practices. Um, and then I think bringing those together, broadly speaking, I'm interested in the politics of indigenous translation. I'm currently at the manuscript uh, with that title. Uh, and um, in this project, uh, and I had intended to do this work um, a few years ago, so it's good to be able to get back to look at how Indigenous visitors to the UK in particular, how they spoke, uh, articulated their, their relationships to land in particular, either through translators um, or, or in English, and uh, to work with uh, uh, people here in the UK to go through 
some of these archives uh, to look for for these um, these kinds of philosophical uh, connections, in particular the Georgian papers at Windsor Castle. So that's my sort of in a nutshell what I'm interested in helping out with. Thank you, Dale, very very much. Can we now turn, please, to Mark? Uh, thank you very much, Joy. Thanks for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real privilege to be part of this team. I thought uh, in, in the few minutes that I had that I would actually go to a, a treaty council record. And I could pick many from many uh, in which the language of brightening the covenant chain is explicitly invoked. Uh, this one's from uh, Fort Stanwix in, uh, on October 24th, 1768. And we have the Crown's representative for Indian Affairs, uh, Sir William Johnson meeting with a large number of Haudenosaunee chiefs and elders uh, but also um, including representatives from Mohawk communities in Canada and Anishinaabe communities in Canada, um, which had with the British defeat of New France begun to enter into new relationships with the British crown. Um, and um, these communities still maintain their distinct identities as indigenous peoples um, and they and other communities uh, point to these historic treaty moments as formative uh, of a distinctive form of constitutionalism Thanks, Sahib, being told no. that um, defines their legal status in Canada. Uh, so at this particular treaty council, Sir William has wampum strings in his hand, uh, threaded uh, shell bead uh, strings and belts. And he begins as follows. Brethren, as I would deal with all people in their own way, and that your ancestors have from the earliest times directed and recommended the observation of a set of rules, which they laid down for you to follow, I do now agreeable to those rules proceed to the ceremony of condolence usual on these occasions. And then with the strings of wampum in his hand, as I said, he cleared their eyes so that they could see each other um, cleared their ears so that they could listen to each other and cleared their throats so that, so that they could speak. The record um, describes this in a rather perfunctory and even flat way, the written record that is, and historians of the covenant chain treaty relationship usually skip over this part to get to the substance of the treaty, um, disregarding this, these earlier uh, ceremonial beginnings. But I wonder if um, this isn't actually the real substance of the Covenant Chain Treaty. Um, for if one looks to Haudenosaunee law, and, and uh, Dale Turner just mentioned the great law of peace, um, which is in part an epic narrative of how a peacemaker brought warring nations together, um, the discovery of the healing power of wampum and the condolence of grief is a turning point in that epic narrative as the Peacemaker says to one of the chiefs, your mind being condoled, we are now ready to make our laws. Something interesting is going on here, the formation of a distinctive form of legality. Um, so just wrapping up, I'm a legal academic and my interest in the covenant chain is to explore its significance from at least three distinct legal perspectives. What does the covenant chain tell us about the legal history of relationships between indigenous peoples and the British? Uh, and the British Crown in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, especially in Canada. What does the relationship tell us, secondly, um, or reveal about Indigenous law and Indigenous understandings of governance? And then thirdly, what lessons do the answers to these questions provide for us today in terms of the goals that we have in Canada of reconciliation between uh, indigenous and non-indigenous peoples and reconciliation of distinct approaches to law and normative order. This is a very practical question for when tensions flare up as they do in the political realm, but also in the courts in Canada today, the old treaty relationship is invoked by indigenous people, yet it remains shadowy and misunderstood by non-indigenous politicians, lawyers and judges. So it's a tremendous privilege to join this group of talented scholars so that I can intensify my research in this area, but from an interdisciplinary and also an intercultural perspective. So I just want to express my thanks uh, to, to Joy and Charles for inviting me to be a part of this project. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. 
Uh, can I next ask, thank you so much. Can I next ask uh, Pekka, please, to speak? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the generous uh, uh, introduction a while ago. So I suppose my entry point uh, uh, to this project is, is, is mainly conceptual and focusing really uh, on, uh, I suppose, on the kinetics. So I, I prepared a, a, a short statement. Uh, our, our maps tend to fail us. The maps in textbooks, monographs, and articles seldom capture the reality on the ground. The color-coded maps that portray territories as neat blocks are detached from reality. They are more aspirational than real. On the ground, things were messy, imperfect, fluid, and ambiguous. Peoples and nations uh, contested for space, searching for perfect sovereignty, falling short almost invariably. Now, sovereignty is the key concept of our project. American history is a history of the search and consolidation of sovereign spaces and territories. Here, however, sovereignty emerges as an elusive and imperfect substance, more an object, uh, uh, objective than a certainty. The Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee embody that reality. One of the most mobile people on the continent, the Iroquois traveled west in large cat canoe fleets, seeking captives, furs, and European goods. Gradually, they transformed into an imperial power. But the Iroquois were an empire with a difference. As amphibious people, the attachment to territory appeared frail and fleeting. They seemed opportunists who preyed on surrounding societies and preferred violent, violent exploitation over diplomacy and persuasion. They were good at conquering, but bad at governing, too shifting and too factional to rule effectively and enduringly. Now, to move forward uh, 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 from those uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, stereotypes, uh, we need to learn to see mobility, not as an obstacle, uh, but uh, as a means of effective empire building. To do so, I suggest the notion of uh, kinetic empires, power regimes that revolve around sets of mobile activities, long distance raiding, seasonal expansions, transnational diplomatic missions, semi-permanent trade fairs, recurring political assemblies, and control over shifting nodes. Power regimes that turn mobility into an imperial strategy and thrived by keeping things, violence, markets, attachments, possessions themselves fluid and in motion. The key function of mobility was connectivity and access. As nomads, the Iroquois did not seek direct control over foreign societies. Instead, they sought access to foreign resources. The Iroquois rose to power by capitalizing on their superior capacity to access key economic and political nodes around them. River valleys for mobility, trade centers for goods, native and colonial settlements for plunder, colonial capitals for tribute, and other indigenous nations for political support. Now here, empire building emerges as a process of networking, of forging linkages through diplomacy, reciprocity, violence, and kinship. The nodes and the linkages among the nodes constituted the, the Iroquois Empire, which in turn, in turn grounded Iroquois sovereignty. Built around strategic nodes, the sovereignty of the Haudenosaunee Confer Confederacy was uneven and full of holes. Yet, it was enough for the Iroquois to become the most powerful indigenous nation in North America. Their reign lasted for four centuries. Wow. Well, wow. Right next, uh, Charles. Got to keep the time. Will do. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm glad to, to, to hear uh, Dale, Mark, and Pekka outline what they're doing, because what I'm doing sort of complements uh, what they're doing in, in a lot of fundamental ways. My, the question that I'm pursuing in my contribution to this project is a simple one, and it is what defined the International Society of Early America? Uh, I want to frame a preliminary answer to that question by looking at the covenant chain as a lens of intercultural diplomacy and as a space where power was negotiated. Um, early America and the space of the covenant chain 
is a space uh, where a settler world of nascent borders and articulations of sovereign power deepened its interactions with an older established but nevertheless dynamic world of indigenous sovereignty in which power relations were structured by deeply ingrained diplomatic norms, customs, and rituals. However, if we approach these interactions from the point of view of monolithic, monolithic settler colonialism or by the dominance of indigenous power, then we obscure the diplomatic and relational complexities that define this particular locale of international society. Now, historians have struggled for a long time about where to fit indigenous polities in the hierarchy of powers in North America, but we need to consider indigenous nations obviously as beyond being domestic nations because to consider them purely as domestic nations has the effect of normalizing colonialism and subtracting indigenous polities from the international sphere in which they naturally inhabited. So my work is really about using the covenant chain as a international system, a system of negotiation, as, as Mark shows us, a, a system of shared particular languages, as a system of power. And this system overlays a landscape uh, that, uh, well, Pekka has just drawn it for us, one that is defined not by neat state borders, but actually by movement, where power is articulated by and through movement. Uh, and the metaphor that crops up again and again in covenant chain negotiations is the metaphor of the path. This is a world of interconnection, of paths of diplomacy, of paths of war, of paths between people, awareness uh, through maps drawn uh, in, in soil with bits of chalk on longhouses, uh, awareness of where everyone sits in relationship to everyone else, a world connected by kingship, a kinship uh, and trade and all sorts of other uh, mechanisms of soft power, a world that is emphatically not controlled by the rituals of European diplomacy, but a world that is shaped predominantly by indigenous diplomacy, and that case is the covenant chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, what's really coming out to me strongly is, is this project is, it's interdisciplinarity at the wood's edge. It, it really is the interdisciplinary nature of it is coming out. It's one thing to, to imagine interdisciplinarity, but when you see it happening, it's, it's well, it's unusual in the intellectual world. So it's brilliant to see. Okay, next I'd love to ask uh, Celeste uh, Pedri Spade, please, to introduce herself. And that will be followed by a video of her work at the Indigenous Fashion Week in Toronto. So, uh, Ani, uh, bonjour everybody. Uh, like Joyce said, I'm a visual anthropologist and painting artist from Northwestern Ontario, from Lac de Malac First Nation, otherwise known as Nezadi Kung, or the place of poplars. So I, I received my PhD from the University of Victoria. And uh, like Joy said, now I work at Queens. So maybe when I come over there, I'll make it to the Victoria and Albert Museum and it'll all come full circle, uh, given what I do. Uh, my primary research interest is in the role of Ojibwe or Anishinaabe visual and material culture in decolonial praxis. Um, namely the restorative and the regenerative work uh, taking place within Ojibwe communities, work that privileges the lived experiences of women and children. So, you know, as a, a visual anthro, uh, I, I do, an artist, I do research creation. And this often explores questions related to the nature and concept of uh, time and historical production within Anishinaabe or Ojibwe worldview. So I approach questions as what I, I call myself a, a mark maker, you know, committed to um, disrupting knowledge systems and their respective institutions that are rooted in colonial worldviews and uh, epistemic traditions that tend to devalue and delegitimize other than written research. Uh, and as a, as a mark maker, I'm, I'm in, invested in exploring the material uh, embodied and performative dimensions of Ojibwe histories, you know, pressing back uh, against the urge to privilege the written text and spoken language in our collective practices. So 
you know, I see this as knowledge that must be learned and carried forward through, you know, these very intimate, often silent, prolonged, embodied relationships with our physical and material surroundings. You know, the idea of like the knowledge in our gestures and our practice. So most recently, I began I began to explore the role and nature of creative practices in Anishinaabe. Um, like knowledge production practices in the way that we think about work through memory, time, body, and place, which brings us to material quay. So uh, material quay is something that I just finished uh, you know, a couple months ago, uh, and it took me about three years to complete. And it consists of five wearable art ensembles that intervene in early settler Anishinaabe relations within my family's homelands. And my family and where I actually am about to head off to is located in northwestern Ontario, like along the, the north, um, north, the northern Minnesota, um, Ontario, northwestern Ontario border. So material kwe, kwe is slang for a woman um, in Anishinaabe Moen. And it, it, it's really meant to intervene in this early relationship that was based uh, considerably on resource extrapolation for colonial fashion, knowing that we witnessed the, the beaver amic brought to near extinction during that time. Uh, so material quay aims to press back against this material history through a strategic design and aesthetic that is about carefully reworking the past in the present in order to refashion a different frame of mind. You know, and one that is uh, filtered by a, a powerful material quay presence. So this work really sits alongside uh, Indigenous art movements uh, that engage uh, Indigenous futurisms, decolonization, and, and Indigenous feminisms, which uh, I see as, um, you know, methodological visioning exercises that ask us to imagine what a more respectful relationship with one, of one another and the land looks like. So, um, and I should say that my husband, we are the parents of four little people under the age of nine and so who are homeschooling because of the pandemic. And so he's holding down the fort while I'm here with visiting with you all today, but he's looking forward to um, also participating. Right, with that, I will queue up the video package. Uh, bear with me, everybody. We will queue to <coughs> right about there. Would you like to just say anything at the end? I know we're going to have many questions at the end about this, but do, do you want to just say any anything at the end of that, just to broaden the context at all? Yeah, or? so that, you know, that was the closing. Um, this was all filmed for uh, Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto, which is a really large cultural festival that takes place every two years in downtown Toronto, obviously because of the pandemic. We had to be creative in, in how we um, you know, brought this all of this work to 
um, yeah, actually now a global audience because we created these films. So this, these films were, um, you know, were, were filmed by Shane Belcourt. Um, the, the score for the, for the films was done by Chris Dirksen. Uh, and this was all made possible through the folks at Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto and their artistic director is uh, Sage Paul. Um, so, you know, this is something that just launched in uh, November. And, uh, you know, now um, it, this particular collection is uh, circulating and I'm really happy to be able to bring it over uh, and share it uh, at both the, the museum, the American Museum in Bath and the museum in uh, Zurich. Thank you so much. It's really exciting work. Uh, thank you very, very much. So finally, uh, as we get towards the end, I want to please for Carolyn Ward to just introduce herself and talk briefly about uh, the Zooniverse People Powered Research Project. And she'll be followed by Dr. Susanna Hobson, who's just gonna say uh, what her role uh, throughout this project has been. Uh, so please, if we could have Caroline and then Susanna. Hi everyone. My name's Caroline Ward and I'm the project administrator for the EHRC Standard Research Grant, Brightening the Covenant Chain, Revealing Cultures of Diplomacy between the British Crown, the Iroquois and their neighbours. This is just day three of my new role on the project and I'm delighted to be part of such an exciting project and to have the opportunity to provide administrative support to this fascinating group of researchers, museum partners and skilled collaborators. As Joy mentioned, I'll also, alongside the admin support, be developing and running the project's planned Zooniverse, People Powered Research Project, which will give the public access to aspects of the primary treaty-based research materials at the project's core. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Caroline. It's great to have you on board and welcome to the team. Uh, so, as Joy said, I'm Susanna Hobson and I'm the Treated Spaces Research Administrator. And I currently work for Gregory Smithers, who I can see here as uh, a P his PDRA for the British Academy Global Professorship Programme. Um, I've worked with Joy and Charles since the inception of Brightening the Covenant Chain, so back in 2017. Um, so I've worked at both pre and post award stage and general grant administration and also budgeting and those kind of things. Uh, specifically, I've collaborated with all our project partners, so doing things like securing the partnerships and then working to develop outreach programs afterwards. So that'd be things like uh, the exhibitions and the soundscape, which I believe we're going to see a clip of in a minute, and other educational outreach events. And from my perspective, it's great to see everyone together finally after like three years of emailing back and forth. So it's really nice to have the whole team together. Um, and if you have any questions at all about Brightening the Covenant Chain or how to collaborate with us, any of our events or outreach activities, you can contact me and my contact details are on the Treated Spaces website. So thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Susanna, very much. And um... I, my mind, tiny mind has been so blown by everything everybody said that I missed the digital output section of the whole thing. I kept thinking about what Mark was saying and Celeste and uh, Pekka. Is, uh... So anyway, can we go back to the digital outputs? Charles is going to talk about the kinetic map. And then we have the indescribable Hein Schur, who's our soundscape guy over in Zurich a place that Susanna and I visited and couldn't afford to eat, literally, uh, on our budget. Uh, but we did have a wonderful time there. And uh, Hein is going to talk about Soundscape as a methodology of research and communication. So Charles, could you speak first about kinetic mapping? Sure. Um, so there are two, uh, two digital, in, in addition to the sort of the more conventional uh, outputs that, uh, that you expect from a project of this, this size, we also have allocated a significant amount of the budget to the production of a couple of digital outputs. And briefly, they are a kinetic map uh, that we're doing in collaboration with King's Digital uh, based at King's College London and supported by a digital PDRA. That post is now open for applications. Uh, details on our website, share it among your networks uh, for us, please. But the kinetic map 
Uh, it picks up the concept that Pekka introduced us to a few seconds ago. Uh, the kinetic map is, is, a, is going to be a sequence of historic maps that are placed in sequential animation, one moving into the other. And the idea is to put treaty spaces and to illustrate movement and paths and, and places covered by treaties, places transformed by treaties, peoples moved by treaties within the broad Northeast into motion. Uh, to depict them on historic maps and then pull out of those maps uh, elements of contemporary detail that we can do multiple layers on the map that show us this dynamic process. Uh, that project is going to begin very, very soon uh, and led by a PDRA, myself and our collaborators at King's Digital. The other uh, is going to be a soundscape that is going to be produced by the, the person who you are going to see next uh, and that is going to be recorded uh, on location in various places in the Northeast, uh, principally at Johnson Hall, uh, who um, Johnson, uh, William Johnson, who Mark mentioned in his presentation. And there we will record various elements of the edge of the woods and the condolence greeting that Mark quoted from in his presentation. So I'm going to share this and we'll watch uh, about a six minute and 50 second video that is uh, introduces us to soundscaping and the philosophy behind it. Hello, everybody. I'm Heinz Schoen. I will record, compose, and produce the soundscape composition for the Brightling the Covenant Chain project, recreating original speeches centered around the Treaty of Niagara. And what now makes the use of soundscape composition a valuable asset when addressing historical issues dealing with indigenous usurper relations. Well, sound, as Murray Schaefer, the godfather of acoustic ecology used to say, touches the inside where sight is merely probing the outside. In that respect, pure sound has a strong advantage uh, at times even over film, depending on what you aim to achieve as the images would create distance where the sounds indeed draw you in. Pure sound can attenuate the othering effect. It can make the ephemeral tangible. It can allow for an atmospheric and effective approach. Coming from a musician's point of view and perceiving music as a transcultural, yet terribly diverse, but as a transcultural language, when working in the domain of sound, one is certainly less burdened with the colonial baggage that anthropology and ethnography, usually by the heritage, bring with them. However, beware of primitivist appropriation. Stay true to your source material. Don't turn it into a burlesque of the exotic. That said, here are a number of opportunities in auditory anthropology and acoustic presentation that open up once one stays aware of the risks of manipulation. Immersion takes place on both ends. On one end, there is the participating observer, or rather the observing participant. You come to a source community as a prospective band leader trying to form a band uh, halfway through, if all works well, turning into a producer who is just orchestrating everything that is being brought in, allowing the first voices to take the lead. Now, your job as the producer is to bring everything into a form that can be understood at the other end, allowing the immersion of an audience thousands of miles away in some cases. At the Nona, the North American Native Museum in Zurich, in Switzerland, where I installed my journeyman's project two weeks in Allard Bay on the Kokwakiwak of Cormorant Island, BC, in the workshops I used to do with school classes, after listening to the piece in the Nono sound chamber, there would always be a boy, and I have no idea why it always indeed would be a boy, it never was a girl, but there would always be a boy asking, do they have cars? And I claim he wouldn't have come to think of that question by looking at stuffed buffaloes, bent with boxes and historic photographs. Sound makes the other come alive, it bridges distances, temporary, geographically, culturally. Back in the day, the Sounding Museum Soundscape Project was acknowledged as a contribution to the 2010 year of the reproachment of cultures by the UNESCO. And I would indeed say for good reason, because it makes the listener familiarize, fraternize in a good way even, in a much more immediate and effective sense than silent objects could as museum exhibits. Soundscape composition can create a fair balance of the culturally specific, historic and living, particularly living and tangible heritage at its dynamic best here, with contemporary realities of the people and circumstances you aim to talk about. Sound is, at any rate, a very intimate experience. It can offer a personal encounter between sender and receiver. 
meaning the members of the source communities and the audiences in a museum or elsewhere. And, and that's what makes it worth pursuing because it can support reproachment of cultures. It can support reproachment of individuals, even also of, of social realities or of global bubbles. You can, mm, in a much better way, disseminate implicit knowledge, which is the bedrock which, which culture and identity are resting on. Mm. Once you devote yourself to the principles of dialogical editing with your informants together, you can create something that you yourself, but especially and foremost, your informants want to tell about themselves. Again, mm, the musical approach or perspective brought in from musicianship is not only considerably more physical and more empathic, it's also, well, mm, bl put bluntly, it can be a lot of fun. You can groove. But once you're in the source community, you can groove together. And you can transport that atmosphere, that liveliness, that joy of grooving together. You can tr transport that into the museum. Of course, not unfiltered, but you can transport a lot of that atmosphere. What you want to be careful about is not to try and remove yourself from the equation, um, thereby creating a simulacrum and a, even more unfavorable, an illusion of objectivity. Once you're a participant observer, at least in my opinion and in my experience, if you take the whole thing seriously and if you have the proper respect for the people you um, who let you in you're not mainly an observer anymore first of all you are a participant you are part of the observed situation and you're also changing it by your presence of course you're changing the soundscape that you record you become one of its creating agents you're part of the band you're part of the collection of keynote sound sound marks and background sounds that comprise any given soundscape mm. And you should be transparent with that, with yourself, but also with your audiences. And that puts you much more at eye level. You want to be, in, and that goes for your audiences as well, or maybe particularly for your audiences, you want your audiences to be, and, and you want to, yourself to be at eye level. Well, I prefer ear level, but that's soundscape and nerdism. So you want, you want to be, and you want your audiences to be at eye level with your source communities, because you're not just dealing with subjects that you take information from, or you do research on, there are, of course, people that you are working with and that you have taken an interest in and that hopefully you've taken an interest in you too. And that's what you do as a soundscape. Okay, um, I should clarify before I come to an end that soundscape isn't that much about actual music. It rather treats the everyday of our acoustic environment with the same care and aesthetic ear as one would carefully composed or, for that matter, improvised music. So um, once you combine that with anthropological, ethnographical, and historical issues, you can come to a level of equality and, and balanced power relations that are often very, very difficult to achieve in research and museum context. Self-reflexiveness is paramount, especially in transcultural work. Soundscape, as coined by Murray Schaefer, was worried about the acoustic equilibrium from an ecological point of view. Uh, or rather listening. And maybe that's yet another reason why the soundscape approach is rooted in a caring, respectful and, and humble attitude. And therefore, I'm very proud to have been invited to contribute my part to the Covenant Chain Research and Public Education Project. Great. Well, Hein won an award for the work he did with uh, Nanum, the North American Native Museum in Zurich, for an uh, intercultural soundscape that he created. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to see <clears throat> what he produces. So finally, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how anyone listening to this might want to connect or collaborate with this panel and Brightening the Covenant Chain generally. We have a website, treatedspaces.com. Uh, we mainly communicate through that and through tweets. So there's very often interesting things for people at all career stages on the tweets. There's a series of um, projects on there of which Brightening the Covenant Chain is the biggest. Uh, we also have a British Academy Global Professor, hello Greg, uh, who's, who's on there also. You can have a look at his work. Um, we are very open to project to project collaboration and to helping people develop future work. If there's any aspect of our work that you want to build upon and, and grow with us, if you, you'd like um, to teach us stuff or learn from us, we're very welcome and open to all of that. 
and uh, we have a series of jobs come up. Currently, we've got a PhD project fully funded for four years, looking at uh, decolonizing mahogany within British stately hills. Uh, and we also have that PDRA role coming up uh, that's advertised on there. So you can find a lot of what's going on on the Treaty Spaces uh, website. Uh, we also, of course, have all the actual formal events, the workshops, the public outreach, the big conferences, which we'll be disseminating through Bath and as many other fori as we can.